visitors with her uh, with us here this morning and and uh, I'll start back here. It's good to have Denise with us here this morning. Hi, Denise. Visiting for the first time. Praise the Lord for that. Rhonda's here. Teresa's back again. I think second time, maybe third. I don't know. She, she says she wants to be a regular, so praise the Lord for that. Uh, praise God. Rhonda's going to be getting baptized today at the end of our service, and we look forward to that. And we also have Heather getting baptized today after that. So we got two baptisms this morning. And it's good to have Terry here and Eli and Will. And uh, what a blessing. Mrs. Sean Halls, glad you could make it today as well. And uh, many others. And uh, Tristan's here. My Le Where's my Lena? Is she here too? She, well, she'll be here. You can't miss her cute little dress she has on today. So good to see everybody here this morning. And we are going to get started this morning with a hymn. Uh, hymn number 44. Hymn number 44. All hail the power. 44. I'm going to sing the first verse, the second verse, and the last. Verses 1, 2, and 4, number 44. Let's stand together as we sing, if you're able to do so this morning. On the first verse, All hail the power of Jesus' name, let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Verse 2. Ye chosen seed of Israel's race, ye ransomed from the fall. Hail him who saves you by his grace and crown him Lord of all. Hail him who saves you by his grace and crown him Lord of all. And the last, oh, that with yonder sacred throng we at his feet may fall. We'll join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. We'll join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. Amen. Brother Sean Halls, if you would please, sir, open our service with a word of prayer here this morning, sir. Our Heavenly Father. Yes. A beautiful day that you <clears throat> that Lord, we could gather together here at Bible Baptist Church and come, Lord, to worship thee in spirit and in truth. We thank you for each visitor, each yes. person that's here today. Yes, Lord. Oh, may you be glorified in the decisions and Lord the baptisms that follow to show their faith and trust in yes. us. Our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, just anoint the pastor with the message that will stir out. Yes, Lord. That, Lord, we have a closer walk with thee. Yes. Be with those that are absent from our midst due to health problems and other difficulties they face. I said, Lord, you'll give them strength. Watch over children's church. Give Brother Brent wisdom. Yes, Lord, Lord please. He teaches there. And, Lord, that you'll just give the, each person today here in Children's Church a listening ear that, Lord, we be able to hear that Spirit speak to our heart. Yes. For thy sake we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. All right, let's take a minute and shake some hands this morning. Let folks know that you're happy to see them here today. Stronger. 
Hey, Tristan. So good to see you. Good to see you. Hi, I'm Tristan. Hi, Liz. How are you? <laughs> That's okay. Good, good morning. morning. Good morning. Oh, sorry. Are you okay? Hopefully you got enough sugar in you to stay Yeah. Awake. <laughs> So it's actually a hospital, like a separate, a standalone hospital. Is she doing better? Yeah, he said that she called him to work and said she's doing better. Right. Amen. All right. All right. Let's go ahead and find your seat here this morning. And before you sit down, though, you can stand right back up again. So if you're still standing, it'll save a little bit of energy. We're going to turn to hymn number 477. Just give me a moment here. 477. It's a hymn called Hold the Fort. Now, I don't know what you do here, but I'll tell you what I've done all throughout the years and in Baptist churches around the country and around the world. Boy, when it gets to the chorus portion of this, where do we get God's answer? Right here. And the Word of God. You got a Bible with you here this morning when we get to the course, and it says, Wave the answer back to heaven. Yep. Take that old Bible and let's wave it and let's just show everybody that we know the answer, that we have the truth, and it's right here in our good old King James Bible. All right, hymn 477. We're going to do verses 1, 3, and 4. 1, 3, and 4. On the first verse. Oh, my comrades, see the signal waving in the sky. Reinforcements now appearing, victory is nigh. Oh, the fold for I am coming, Jesus signal still. Wave the answer back to heaven, by thy grace we will. Verse 3, see the glorious banner waving, hear the trumpet blow. In our leader's name we triumph over every foe. Oh, the fourth, for I am coming, Jesus signal still. Wave the answer back to heaven, by thy grace we will. Fierce and long the battle rages, but our help is near. Onward comes our great commander, cheer my comrades, cheer. Pull the fold, for I am coming, Jesus signal still. Wave the answer back to heaven, by thy grace we will. All right, amen, you may be seated. Yeah, little Baptocostal there this morning, amen. Hey, look it, if all these other churches can praise God, we can too. Amen. That's right, we can too. It's not just their responsibility, it's our responsibility to give God praise. Look at all that He's given us. Look at all that He's done for us. Boy, oh boy, He deserves more praise than we give Him. Amen. All right. Well, let's see what we got here. Announcements here this morning. First of all, as a blessing, I had the, the uh, uh, teen Sunday school class today. And I hope I figured something out today. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I gave them all kinds of sugar. And I hope they stay awake. You stayed awake back there? Oh, come on now. I hope they stay awake for the service. Man, I gave them 
chocolate, milk, and cookies, and peanut butter cups, and I'm going to wait, see them stay awake. All right. Well, that was a blessing being with them, and, and, uh, and I hope that they appreciated that as well. I enjoyed it, certainly. Uh, announcements here. First of all, we got this uh, next. All right, tonight, 530, uh, we got a men's and women's prayer time, prayer meeting just before our service tonight at 530. Uh, Wednesday night, we got a Bible study and prayer time as well. Uh, we're studying... Uh, some prophecy. Uh, we, we've gone off the, we were studying in the book of Acts, but because of the things that are going on in the Middle East right now, I uh, decided to talk a little bit about prophecy for a couple of weeks, maybe a few weeks. We'll see. Uh, but we're talking about uh, the battle of Gog and Magog. Ezekiel's war as found in Ezekiel chapter 38. Yeah. And, that, and uh, this coming Wednesday night, we're going to get into what the Bible says and try to identify each of the nations that will someday and could be someday soon coming together uh, with one another against the nation of Israel. And so uh, if you're interested in that, come on out uh, or listen to it online uh, this Wednesday night, 7 o'clock. This coming Saturday morning at 8.30 in the morning, we got a men's prayer breakfast. Uh, men, that means you, okay? Come on out, 8.30 in the morning. We're going to have some food. We're going to have some time in prayer. There is a sign-up sheet at the back table, just so we have an idea uh, how many will be there so we know... Uh, you know, how many pounds of bacon we need to buy. All right, everybody gets a pound of bacon. So we need to know that ahead of time. So please sign up back there at the back table. 10 o'clock this Saturday, soul winning and visitation after the men's prayer breakfast. Next Sunday, we're going to have our uh, end of the month uh, uh, routine, so to speak. We'll have Sunday school at its regular time. We'll have our morning service at its regular time. That will be fo uh, followed by a fellowship meal uh, right here in the fellowship hall and then at one o'clock we'll have an afternoon service that afternoon service will replace our evening service next week uh, we're having pulled pork from what i understand and uh, also we do need people to bring some of the side dishes so if you plan on coming for the meal next week once again we've got a sign up sheet at the back table and there's some spots there for you to sign up for some of the food some of the side dishes okay the church will provide uh, the meat the pulled pork and we just need some help with some of the other dishes. Okay. Uh, then Saturday, May the 11th, mother-daughter banquet, mother-daughter brunch. Okay, 11 a.m. And uh, once again, there's a sign-up sheet. <laughs> All right, we need to know how many plan on coming. Now, you could bring, it doesn't have to be a relative. You could bring a neighbor. You could bring a friend. Okay. Uh, it, ladies, everyone's welcome to come. Uh, yeah. You don't have a mom. You don't have a daughter. You want to adopt someone for the day. Uh, talk to, uh, to Brother Beeman, uh, talk to Brother Brent, find out if there's any uh, young people within our church that come to our services that would like to come to that. Maybe they don't have someone to bring them. And uh, let's do that. I encourage you to do that. So once again, sign up sheet. Guess where? Back table. All right. Our missionary of the week, uh, Braxton and Elizabeth Jackson in India. And a prayer request, I am so glad to say that uh, uh, Miss Donna Beeman is doing better. Yeah. Right, Doc? And she called you this morning, didn't she? She called you. Praise God. We've been praying for her. Oh, what a, what a blessing that is. And we want to continue to pray for her recovery. D uh, double pneumonia. Right, Doc? Double pneumonia. Fluid on her lungs. Very serious. Praise the Lord. God hears our prayers. God answers our prayers. Please, Lord, continue to bless her. It's also great that uh, Miss Dorothy Bryson, she's back at uh, the nursing home. She's out of the hospital. Last week she was in the hospital. She's back. I uh, also pray for Bonnie Phillips and Linda Hill, Vi Arnold, Don Smith, Sarah Sean Halls, who is here today. Praise the Lord for that. And uh, Sissy Felton, Venice Terrell, Haley McCutcheon. All right, others on our prayer list. And of course, let's lift each and all of us up. Let's lift us all up in prayer. Each and every one of us has a need. Everybody here in this room has a need, amen? amen. Everybody, everybody. And uh, so let's remember to lift each other up as a church in prayer. All right, all that being said, now why don't we uh, go on now to another hymn, one more hymn. 
And at this time, I'll ask you if you can, if you're able to do so, let's stand uh, one more time. And uh, we're going to sing number 58, And Can It Be, hymn number 58. And again, if you're able to stand along with us, please do so. If not, if you need to remain uh, sitting, that is fine as well. Number 58, And Can It Be, one of my favorite hymns. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Died he for me who caused his pain, for me who him to death pursued? Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? He left his Father's throne above, so free, so infinite his grace, emptied himself of all but love, and bled for Adam's helpless race. Tis mercy all immense and free, oh my God, it found out me. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke the dungeon flame with light. My chains fell off, my heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Whoa, what great love God has for us. Praise the Lord. Brother Kerry, would you please pray over our offering here this morning? Yes, yes. 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 Now, Lord, just give Pastor Markowski the words to preach. Give Please, Lord. Give us ears to hear and willingness to apply them to our life, Lord, and may you bless the gift and the giver, Lord, to forge your kingdom. Lord, pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. <clears throat>
Amen. 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 Thank you, Miss Peeler. What a blessing. Do you know what Jesus did for you? Amen. You realize, if you're a Christian here this morning, exactly what happened there. When yeah. Jesus died on the cross for your sins and suffered for you, was buried, rose again, defeated sin and death forever and hell forever, and you trusted in Him, you're now a child of God, forever secure. Amen. With a home in heaven someday, with a, yes. an opportunity to meet the Lord and Savior someday, and meet your loved one someday, and spend an eternity with them. Oh, thank you for that. That was a wonderful, wonderful song. Praise God for that. All right, got your Bibles this morning. Open up to the book of Job. All right, open up to the book of Job. It's in your Old Testament. Find First and Second Samuel, then First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, uh, Esther, and then Job. Or you could just find Psalms and Proverbs and turn to your left. That might be easier. That's the book right before Psalms. We'll stand together in the reading of the reverence of the Word of God if you're able to do so this morning. But just to give you a little heads up first, you don't have to stand just yet. The book of Job is probably the oldest book in the Bible was certainly written before the Lord gave the Ten Commandments, before He gave the law, before He gave it to Moses on the top of Mount Sinai. From a historical standpoint, the giving of the law occurred around 1490 B.C., whereas this story, uh, this story about the happening in Job's life, uh, occurred some 30 years earlier, around 1520 B.C. So when you consider that fact, if there was a discussion covering the topic of sin or the authority of God or of man's relationship with God, it would have been impossible to avoid all references to the law. If the law had already been made known, but it wasn't. And that's why there's no reference to commandments to that here in the yeah. book of Job. Job was not a fictional character, uh, nor was his story a parable. 
Uh, he was a real man. Job was also later referenced to in Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 20 in the Old Testament, and then again in the New Testament in James chapter 5, verse number 11. Therefore, the events that we uh, are going to read that are recorded here in the book of Job, they are historical events. So with all that being said, let's stand together. Job chapter number 1, and we're just going to read through the first five verses in Job chapter number 1. We'll read them responsively. I'll read the odd number of verses, and I ask if you would please join in with me on the even-numbered verses. Job chapter 1, verse 1, the Word of God says this, There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and eschewed evil. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance also was 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels and 500 yoke of oxen and 500 she-asses and a very great household, so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the east. And his sons went and feasted in their houses, every one his day, and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. And let's join together in verse number 5. We'll read it together. And it was so when the days of their feasting were gone about, that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. Let's pray together. Lord, I'm so thankful for everyone that's here today. Lord, I'm, uh, I'm so thankful for my salvation. I'm so thankful for the Bible. Lord, we can go on and on and on. But Lord, we're here this morning because we love you and we also want to hear from you. So Lord, I pray now that you just speak through me here this morning. Lord, please do not allow me to say anything. Don't let anything come out of my mouth, Lord, that is not appropriate, that's not, that's not from God, that's not of God, that doesn't edify and lift you up, Lord. And Lord, I pray that you just guide my words, guide my thoughts, guide the preaching this morning. And Holy Spirit, it's your job here to... Convict hearts, to speak to people's hearts and, their, and uh, help them to change their lives and their outlook. And Lord, so please now bless the preaching your word for the sake of these dear people and for your glory we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, you may be seated. Uh, back in the early to mid-90s, I was working, uh, if you may know about this, I'm, I'm a actually a life member of the Professional Golfers Association of America. I spent 30 years working in the golf business before I got full-time into the ministry. And back then in the, in the mid-90s, uh, I was working as a head golf professional at a golf course in the Rochester, New York area. And at that time, I had a friend of mine uh, who played golf on the LPGA Golf Tour, the Ladies Professional Golf Association. She was a tour player. She was good. And she, uh, she had some family that lived in that area. This was back in Rochester, New York. And she, she, she called me up one day. And she said, Larry, she said, is there any chance that uh, you can get me and, and us onto the golf course that I'm going to be playing in the tournament there in the Rochester area? Get us a practice round and we can play together. I've never played there before. So I said, sure thing. I can do that. And so I did. I got us a practice round. The, uh, she was going to play the following week in the tournament. And I got us a practice round the week prior. So we're out and about. I had two assistant pros from, uh, from the course I was working at join us. So we four of us went out and played. Beautiful June day. I mean, gorgeous, 75 degrees. What a wonderful day. Uh, we get done playing nine holes of golf and my friend played from the men's tees. If you know anything about golf, she played from the men's tees. Never saw the course before. Shot two under par from the men's tees. He was a quiet player. So we're, we're walking off the ninth green, and from the parking lot comes walking this gentleman, and I recognize him. He was an LPGA rules official. And uh, I recognized him because becoming a member of the Professional Golfers Association, I had to take a course on rules. And he was the one that taught the course. So I knew of this man, and he comes walking over. We said hello, and he goes right to my friend. And he says, uh, 
are you a fully exempt player? Fully exempt means at the beginning of the year, she could check off whatever tournament she wanted to play in. I want this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. I'm going to skip this one, play in this one. She doesn't have to qualify, nothing. She's already qualified. So she had, you know, whatever I want to play in. She goes, yeah, fully exempt. He said, okay, did you know that you're not supposed to play the course the week before the tournament? Because you're fully exempt. You should be playing on the LPGA Tour event that's being held in another city. Or you play any other course in the world, but not this one. She's like, I didn't know that. He said, okay, that'll cost you a thousand. Thousand dollar fine. Boom. Just like that. Whoo, boy, that put a damper on our second nine holes, let me tell you. But you know what? My friend, she had an LPGA Tour guidelines and rule book, but she never read it. She was supposed to, and that's why she was held accountable for her actions. Even though she didn't read the, the manual, she couldn't say, oh, it's not my fault. It was your fault. See, we've been given a procedures manual as well, and you know what? We're going to be judged by this as well someday. But now let's go back to the story of Job. Job, he's a hero in the Bible. Uh, we will see as we continue reading his story that Job passed the test with integrity, the Bible says. He faced many trials and tribulations, and yet it says in Job chapter 1, verse 22, he says, In all this Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. The Bible also goes on to say in chapter 2 and verse 10, In all this did not Job sin with his lips. So we're going to dig into this story a little bit more. We're going to actually see what happened here in Job's life. If you're not familiar with the story, and it might be the first time you've ever heard of it, but we're going to just talk a little bit here right from the Word of God. Job chapter 1, starting in verse number 6 now. And I'm going to start reading. I'm going to read fast, so listen quickly. All right, verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. Uh, we know in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, the Bible says that he walks around seeking whom he may devour. Yeah. That's what Satan wants to do in our lives. He wants to devour you. Even if you're already saved, he wants you to lose your joy. He wants you just, you know, the fact that you're thinking, am I truly saved? Am I not? He just wants to go after you. If you're not saved, he doesn't ever want you to come to know Christ as your Savior. He's walking about seeking whom he may devour. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? He flees from evil. He avoids evil. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Hast not thou made an hedge about him, and about his house, and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. So Satan's saying, look, at you, you put a hedge about him. That's why he, he loves you and, and, and uh, worships you uh, the, way, the best way he can, because you're protecting him. Verse 11, but put forth thine hand now, and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. And there was a day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the asses feeding behind, beside them. And the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The fire of God has fallen from heaven and hath burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away, yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there, there came 
also another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house. And it fell upon the young men, and they are dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. Just so you know the whole story here, because this again may be the first time you've ever heard this story. I don't know. I'm going to read a few more verses for you here, and then we'll get into the context of the message here this morning. Again, there was a day, this is verse 2, chapter 1. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said unto Satan, From whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord, and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth? a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil, and still he holdeth fast his integrity. After all that happened to Job, he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. And Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life. But put forth thine hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand, but save his life. So went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord, and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown. And he took him a pot shirt to scrape himself withal, and he sat down among the ashes. Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. But he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? And all this did not Job sin with his lips. Job had lost his oxen, his mules, his sheep, his camels, his servants, and finally he lost his sons and his daughters. And then we read that he also lost his health. Guess what he had left? The only thing he had left was a nagging wife. Satan left that alone. He said, that's going to be bad enough, just like that. We read what Job had, but this message this morning is this, what Job didn't have. Yeah. What Job didn't have. Before these tragedies occurred, Job was considered to be, as the Bible says, perfect and upright, one that feared God and eschewed or avoided evil. But the only thing that he had when it came to the things of God, the only thing he had was tradition. The only thing that he had was his family's history and his family's stories about how they previously had worshipped God. The one thing they did was the fact that they offered burnt offerings. It started in Genesis chapter 4 where Adam's son Abel brought an offering to the Lord from the firstlings of his flocks and that sacrifice was accepted of God. We also see in Genesis chapter 8 that Noah, after the flood had receded across the land, that he built an altar unto the Lord, and he took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. Traditions. That's how Job knew to worship God. And Job was a great father. And he cared deeply about his children, and he cared about their relationship with God. That's why the, it says there in verse number 5 that Job rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all, all of his children. For Job said, it may be, it's possible. It, it, it's just possible. So I'm going to offer these burnt offerings for my children. It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. The Bible says thus, did Job continually. Just in case they sin, Lord, I'm offering these burnt offerings on their behalf because they may not do it. 
And I don't want you to hold it against him, Lord. You see, Job feared God. And he worshipped him the only way that he knew how, the way his ancestors did, and that's with burnt offerings. That was all that Job had when it came to what he should do or what he could do. He had his traditions. And in this case, it was an acceptable or a good tradition. But, you know, sometimes tradition is not so good. You see, in our world today, some people, they uh, inherit religion instead of Jesus. Amen. They'll inherit a, you know, we, oh, well, we're a member of this church. Well, that doesn't do you anything. Being a member of a church doesn't save you. Amen. Okay? Uh, so, some people have the wrong traditions. But I can say this, here at Bible Baptist Church in New Franklin, we still have some great traditions in our church. Amen? We're not going to stray from that fact. We still preach from the good old King James Bible. We still preach against sin and against evil. We still sing the great hymns of the faith. We still go soul winning and have prayer services. We still preach that sinners are lost without Jesus and that they need to be saved. And that salvation is only obtainable by trusting in Jesus Christ as your Savior. We still preach that when you get saved, you should be baptized as a public profession of your faith. Yes. We're blessed to have in our possession the Word of God. But all that Job had was burnt offerings. He had no Bible. He had no Moses, no Genesis, no Exodus, no Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. He didn't have the Psalms. He didn't have the Proverbs for wisdom. He didn't have an Old Testament or New Testament. He didn't have John and Romans. He didn't have Revelation. He had no Bible. Yeah. Everybody understand that this morning when you think about that book? He didn't have any of that. Job didn't have a Bible. Do you know what else Job didn't have? He didn't have the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost does not come upon the believers in Christ until after Jesus was caught up to heaven and then the disciples were filled with the Holy Ghost as it says in Acts chapter 2 verse 4. God spoke to people directly back in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament we have the Holy Ghost after the, the ascension of Jesus into heaven after his resurrection. Job also did not have a local New Testament Bible believing hymn singing soul winning Baptist church. Glory to God for this church. Amen. Amen. Glory to God for what it stands for in this community. A beacon of light in a dark world. Job didn't have a church. He didn't have a Christian school either. He didn't have a Bible college to attend. All he had was tradition that started with Abel. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it says in verse 15, Therefore, brethren, stand fast, and hold the traditions or the instructions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. You hear something about the Bible, which may not be exactly Bible, but it's something that you can learn, that you can apply to your life, that has biblical implications. Paul is there telling them, you know, stand fast in that. Listen to that. All right, hold those instructions which you've been taught whether it's by word or by our epistle, by the writings of Paul. Whatever it is, you need to stick with it. Hold those instructions. You know, I was taught as a young boy, I was taught to hold the door for a lady. Okay? Show me where that is in the Bible. It's not. But it's the right thing to do. Amen? It's the right thing to do. I always will try to say yes, sir, or yes, ma'am, when, uh, when I'm out and about. Uh, I mean, we just happened to be out yesterday having a, having a meal together at a restaurant, and our, our waiter was probably 20 years old. I'm calling him sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, thank you sir. Thank you for your help, sir. Thank you. you know, and he had his name on his tag, too, but still. 
You know, where does it say that in the Bible? It doesn't say that, but it's the right thing to do. Amen? Amen. It's the right thing. Showing respect. I'll always try to say, yes, sir, yes, ma'am. Uh, I was taught that at an early age. We taught our children that at an early age. And I'll tell you, it was a blessing. One day, my son was calling me. Uh, he was on his phone. He was at the counter at a convenience store getting one of those, like, like 500-ounce drinks, you know, that you can get for 99 cents. And, and uh, so he's there at the counter, and he's getting a drink. And he had on, oh, one of them things in his ear there. I don't know what that is. And he had that, and so he could talk, his phone's here, that thing's up there, and he could talk to me. I just don't understand the technology, but that's not the point. <laughs> the point was, I hear him talking to the cashier. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, it's my boy. It's my boy. I'm proud to hear that. When I was young, I used to call a mailman Mr. Mailman. Mr. Mailman. Many years ago, my wife and children were invited to go to the New York State Police Academy in Albany, New York. Uh, they went there for a tour, okay? Uh, she wasn't getting imprisoned. Uh, she went there for a tour. And uh, I knew a, a state trooper. He was a good friend of mine. And he set up the whole, the whole educational day for my family. I mean, they left there with New York State Police hats and T-shirts and coffee mugs. As a matter of fact, I got the mug in my office right now. That's what made me think of this. And uh, you see, my wife uh, homeschooled our children, and so it was a wonderful educational day for them to go and, and be there, going through. They even met the head of the New York State Police, happened to be there that day. But all day long, she kept getting ma'am sandwiches. You know what a ma'am sandwich is? Oh, if you're in the military, you know what a ma'am sandwich is. Uh, ma'am, good morning, ma'am. Ma'am, yes, ma'am. Ma'am, thank you, ma'am. Those New York State Police cadets were trained to do that. It was a tradition, and it still is today, and it's right. It's respectful. We need to be respectful for others. Now, Job only had his traditions. And even though he went through great adversity, Job still finished with integrity. He didn't have the Word of God. He didn't have church. He didn't have the Holy Spirit residing inside him. He didn't have the great hymns of faith. He didn't have uh, uh, Christian education. Another thing that he did not have is he didn't have a good wife either. <laughs> Satan was allowed to touch all that Job had, and yet Satan left Job's wife alone. She told Job in Job 2.9, curse God and die. If you know the rest of the story in the book of Job and all about the friends that Job had, you'd say, with friends like that, who needs enemies? Yeah. His friends came to him after all this had happened. Job basically lost everything. His friends come to him, his so-called friends, and, 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 and they're basically telling him, look, you know what's happening here? God's correcting you. All right, you, you're doing something in your life. You're being a hypocrite. You say you love God and you obviously don't. They're trying to say stuff like that to him. They're telling him, if you were pure and upright, God would bless you and not do all this to you. They're trying to tell him, God will not cast away a perfect man. If you were perfect, the Bible says, what does it say? It says that he was perfect and upright. But his friends came to him and said, God will not cast away a perfect man. But he did. God allowed it to happen. But his friends were saying all this garbage to him. Job had everything going against him. Adversity, hardship, disappointment. And you know what he did? The Bible says that he finished his course with integrity. Dude. Integrity. He had nothing but tradition. He still made it through. Job knew that there was a God because he does say there in that book, Blessed be the name of the Lord. He knew there was a God. He had the traditions or the stories about how God made the earth and all that was in it. He had the witness of nature that there is a God or creator. It also says later in the book in chapter 19 verse 25. For I know that my Redeemer liveth. Yes. He had faith and it showed in his actions. He didn't have the things that we have today. And yet he finished strong. He finished with integrity. And I want to motivate you here this morning. On how to finish this race with joy. Every church across America has a long list of has-beens or used-to-be's. 
used to be in our church. You can't find them anymore. They used to be in church, whether it's here or anywhere, you can't find them. They're at home. They're out on the golf course on a Sunday. They're out fishing or hunting. Now look at, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be a has-been. And I don't want to see any of you become a has-been either. The Apostle Paul said this, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I've kept the faith. Job lived his life without the vast amount of knowledge that you and I have today. For example, Job didn't know that he was in a contest with the devil. God propped up Job and he challenged the devil with the life of God's servant, Job. It says there in verse number 8, it says, And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? There's none like him in the earth, perfect, upright, fears God, eschews evil. God is basically saying this, Job, I'm counting on you. I want you to keep up with those burnt offerings. I want you to stay strong and resist evil. I know that you don't have a Bible. I know that you don't have a church. I know that you don't have the Holy Ghost. But Job, finish strong anyways. Don't stop. Regardless of what's going on in your life. Don't stop. Job also had no idea how much confidence God had in him. But you know what? We know today that we are in a battle. We're in like a wrestling match in our life with, with the devil, with evil. We know that we are in a war. We know that we have an adversary that is seeking to destroy us, to discourage us, to devour us. That's why the Bible tells us that we're to put on the whole armor of God. Because it's a battle. We know that every day that we get up, we're going to have to defeat the devil. That's why we all need to be in prayer. We all need to be reading our Bibles. We all need to be in church when the doors are open. We all need to keep on keeping on. Today we know that, but Job didn't know that. Job had no clue. He didn't know that he was in a contest with the devil. Secondly, Job didn't know that there was a hedge about him. We read about the hedge of protection that Satan said, God, that's why he loves you, that's why he serves you, because you put a hedge about him. You and I both know that nothing's allowed into our lives until it goes past the desk of God. Up, and, and he approves it. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, Amen. that ye may be able to bear it. We know that there are some boundaries that Satan cannot cross. But Job didn't know that. Yet he still got up every day. And there must have been a point where he said, How much more of all of this am I going to be able to take? But he still believed in God. He says this later in chapter 13, verse 15. He says this, Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. Amen. What a great man of God. Job didn't have Philippians 4, 13. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. I mean, how many times have you referred to that verse, quoted that verse, relied on that verse in your own personal life? I do it all the time. Job didn't have Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. But guess what Job did? He got up in the morning and he said this, I'm going to serve God today. Amen. If others join me, fine. We'll serve together. If they don't, fine. I'll go it alone. If my wife joins me, great. If not, I'm still going to serve them. Today, even with all that we know and have, there are churches where people are dropping like flies. They'll say that the Christian life's too hard. I'm done. I've had enough. I'm dropping out. 
Third thing Job didn't have was this. He didn't know when it was going to be over. But we know that God's in control. Amen? Yes, amen. We know that there's going to be an end. We have God's Word. It's a book that tells us all about the end. It's a book of history. It's a book of prophecy. Job didn't have that. The fourth thing that Job didn't have was this. He didn't know that it was all being recorded. He didn't know that there would be 42 chapters about his life that would be preserved by God for us to read 3,500 years later. Amen. He didn't know that his story would be the subject of preaching for hundreds and hundreds of years later. But we know that our lives are being recorded. We will be held accountable for what we do or what we don't do for Christ. And if you're not saved here this morning, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, I want to warn you here this morning. There's a recording of every single one of your life's sins. And someday you're going to kneel before a righteous God and you're going to be held accountable and you're going to have to pay the penalty for every one of those sins. And that penalty is not an eternity in heaven. It's an eternity in hell, in a lake of fire that was prepared for the devil and his angels. Pastor, that's impossible. How can God know every single one of my sins, especially since there's been so many of them? I believe that it's possible because you know what the Bible says that is there anything too hard for God? Amen. Let me ask you this. Do you think, now there's some amazing technology that's out there today. Amazing. Do you think God's technology is better than man's technology? <laughs> okay, everybody's shaking their head. Of course. All right. Well, God's technology is greater than ours. You know, but I'll tell you something. I'll stop at a red light. I'm afraid to pick my nose. Because I don't know what camera's picking that up, you know. I got in the mail, when we were still living back in New York, I got in the mail one day, and our children live in Indiana. And uh, one of our vehicles was there at the time. And I get a, a ticket in the mail. Camera caught me, didn't catch me, caught my car kind of going through a, like the, the light had turned yellow and then red, right? But the car kind of went through the red light, I guess. My car, I wasn't in it. I got the ticket. Here's a camera on a light taking a photograph of the car. And I mean, not just one, but boom, 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 like several photographs. Here's the car, yellow, red, red. Here it is going through the red. Boom, here's your fine, $100. That kind of technology is out there. We know that. I mean, they've got satellites up there right now that can look down and, and, and see a, a dime out on the parking lot. Yes. Now, do you think God's technology is greater than man's technology? Of course it is. Of course it is. Now, I've had some valleys in my life, but none like Job. And I don't know what valley you're going through right now. I don't, I don't know. I mean, some of you folks, I'm, I'm starting to get to know people. And I'm getting to know about maybe issues in your life, problems, physical problems, things like that. But I don't know each and every one of you, and, and even for the ones I do know, there's probably more things that I'm not even aware of. And, and frankly, it's not my business. But here's the thing. We need to keep going. We need to keep climbing. We need to keep on keeping on. We need to keep going. You see, what's going to happen? People are going to see how you handle that situation. That's right. are, 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 are you giving up on God because of something that you're going through? Or are you going to rest on Him and lean on Him? And, and like I told the, the teens today, that Jesus says, My yoke is easy. My burden is light. All right? Give it to God. Let Him carry you through it. 
Become closer to God. Have a better relationship with God and He will help you through all that stuff. Oh, well, boy, do we need that. We need that. The fifth thing here this morning, and Job never knew why this happened to him in his life. He didn't know why. He feared God. He eschewed evil. He was a perfect and upright man. Why did he have to suffer? He didn't know. He didn't know he was going to be an example for us. Yeah. Job didn't have 1 Peter 5.10 either. But the, the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his ex eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. Job suffered. He didn't know why. Again, he didn't have Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. He didn't have that. He didn't understand. But you know what? Job never quit. Amen. Never quit. And he didn't charge God foolishly. Neither did he sin with his lips. If God can use this man from the oldest pen book in the Holy Bible to be an example for us of how we should finish out our lives, then I think we need to listen. And I think we need to do it. Regardless what's going on in our life today, we keep on keeping on. Keep on keeping on. Job didn't know that he was in a contest with the devil. Job didn't know that there was a hedge about him. Job didn't know when it was going to be over. Job didn't know that it was all being recorded. Job never knew why this had happened to him in his life. And finally, this morning, we're going to look at the last chapter of Job. If you're still there in the book of Job, Job chapter number 42. We're going to see the last point here this morning. Job chapter number 42, starting in verse number 10. The Bible says, And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Also the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. You see, Job never sinned. Oh yeah, he was upset. He didn't like what happened to him, but he never sinned. And then finally, what does he do? Finally, he says, you know what? I've got these friends, and they've got issues as well. I'm going to start praying for them. I'm not going to be concerned about me. I'm going to be concerned more about others than about myself. That's what God wants us to do, folks. We've all got problems. God wants us to bring our problems before Him and give them to Him, let Him take care of them. But He also wants us to be praying for others. Not just ourself. You start putting other people ahead of you. You watch what God does in your life. Praying for others. God heard that. God the Father heard that and said, Okay, Job, enough is enough. That's almost like you finally saw the light here, Job. And he did that. And he says he gave him twice as much as he had before. Then came there unto him all his brethren and all his sisters... And all they that had been of his acquaintance before and did eat bread with him in his house and they bemoaned him and comforted him over all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. Every man also gave him a piece of money and every one an earring of gold. So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning for he had 14,000 sheep and 6,000 camels and a thousand yoke of oxen and a thousand she asses. He also, he had also seven sons and three daughters. Wait a minute, that's what he had before. Yeah. It says that he, that, that, what? It said that he, it doubled. That, that's not double. Oh, well, sure is. Because his sons and daughters from before, they may not be on this earth, but they were with God. Yeah. So yes, he did have his sons and daughters doubled 
Verse 16 says, After this lived Job 140 years and saw his sons and his sons' sons, even four generations. So Job died being old and full of days. He accomplished his goals. As Christians, we know that the end is going to be better than the beginning. There's a place called heaven that we're going to someday. We can't even imagine how great it's going to be. What a wonderful place heaven's going to be. We also know that there are going to be some peaks and some valleys. There are going to be some bumps along the way. We know the Bible's true. We know that Jesus is real. We know that salvation is only through Jesus. We know heaven's real. John wrote in John chapter 14, verse 1, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there ye may be also. Verse 6, as Jesus saith unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. How about you here this morning? Job didn't have all the things that you have at your disposal. Yet he ran the race and he finished strong. And he also didn't know the very things that were preached about this morning either. But now you do. Now you do. What are you going to do with it? Christian, what's your excuse? Hard to think of one now, isn't it? Maybe you've never trusted Christ as your Savior. Let me tell you from the Bible, all right, we've all sinned. This is what the Bible says. We've all sinned, come short of the glory of God. There's a penalty for sin. The wages of sin is death. Then there's some great news, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus died for our sins. He paid the penalty for our sins so that we don't have to pay the penalty. But if you die unsaved, you never trust Christ as your Savior. Someday you'll stand before the Lord, you'll be judged for your sins, and you'll be cast into an eternity to a place that was prepared for the devil and his angels. You don't want that. I don't want that for you. Today, the Bible says, today is the day of salvation. Amen. You've heard a story today about a man named Job and all the things he went through. And the fact that he finished strong, he was a man of integrity. But he didn't have what we have. You've got this. We've got God's Word. God's Word tells you that you need to trust Jesus for your salvation. Trust in Him and only Him. And that it's the only way to heaven. I hope it's real in your life. I hope that you trusted Him, that you, you accepted His payment for your sin. At one point in time in your life, because if you did, if you did that one time and you accepted Christ and you repented and trusted in Him and Him alone to save you, you're saved today. Amen. You're going to heaven someday. Jesus paid the price. He is our Lord and Savior. Heaven is for real. It is for real. Some people look at the Bible and they don't believe it. But the Bible has prophecy in it, which is all coming true. Amen. The Bible is a historical book also, and it's all true. It's not make-believe. It's not fiction. God's Word is true. You need to believe it. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, trust Him today. Why don't you? The greatest decision you'll ever make in your whole life. If I could have the pianist come forward, please. We're going to have an invitation here in a moment. If the Holy Spirit spoken to you in any way, I ask that uh, you just come on forward. Use an old-fashioned altar. Bring it for the Lord. Whatever the Holy Spirit may be talking to you about here this morning, I don't know what it is. Maybe you're going through some trials and tribulations in your life and you're, you're upset. You're upset at God. Don't be upset at God. All right? Come down here and give it to God. Let Him take care of it in your life. This isn't a time in history to want to stay away from church either. This is a time in history where you want to be in church. 
not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as we see the day approaching. That day is the return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You see the signs of the times. I don't have to go into more detail. You need to be in church. You need to be following the Lord. As the piano begins to play, come on forward. Use an old-fashioned altar. For those that are going to be baptized today, now's the time to come on forward. And you can, uh, my wife will go with you. Uh, right through that door there, you can go back there and, and, uh, and get changed and get ready for baptism. All right, if we've got any uh, juniors in the back, you can come on in at this time and sit quietly in the back of the church. All right. If the Lord spoke in your heart here this morning, come and use an old-fashioned altar, please. Use that altar. Seek the Lord's face. Give it to God, whatever it might be. I can't imagine reacting the way Job reacted, having everything taken from him, everything in his life. Everything of value. And yet he was a man of integrity. And he finished strong, he finished well. Oh, what a blessing. What a blessing. What an example for us. He didn't know he was going to be that example. He had no clue. 3,500 years later, we're talking about him still. Messages about him all over the world being preached even today by other pastors, other preachers. God's given us many great examples out of his word. He wants us to be drawn closer to him. He wants us to be in his word, studying his word, but most importantly, obeying what his word says. Job didn't have that, but he was still obedient to what he knew. Everything he knew to do, he did. Brother Sean Halls. Brother Sean Halls. As our heads are bowed and eyes are closed yet. Some, are, some have come to the altar to pray. If there's anything that we can do to help you answer any questions that you might have. Maybe you're not saved and you'd like to know how that you could have that gift of eternity. Maybe you're here today and you've never been baptized. But you'd like to let people know that I have Jesus in my heart. Talk to us. Oh, how good God is. You can look up and take that. Let's sing a song. We'll at least sing the first verse while they're preparing for baptism. Have two of them today. And so uh, they are going to identify themselves to you today that, hey, they're saved. That's one of the greatest joys there is for a pastor. Begin to see the church begin to grow. Maybe you're not a member, but you'd like to talk to the pastor about membership. Do it today before you leave because it's an important part to identify yourself with Bible Baptist Church of New Franklin. Let's all stand together and let's sing that first verse, number 230, Grace Greater Than Our Sin.
marvelous grace. Oh, yeah, Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilled. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. On that second, sin and despair like the sea waves cold. Swept in the soul with infinite loss. Grace that is greater, yes, grace untold. Points to the refuge, the mighty cross. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace. God's grace, grace that is greater than all my sin. On that third, dark is the stain that we cannot hide. What can avail to wash it away? Look, there is flowing a crimson tide. Whiter than snow you made today. Grace, grace, marvelous grace. Grace that is gardened and cleansed within. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all our sin. On that fourth. Marvelous, infinite, matchless grace Freely bestowed on all who believe Ye that are long to see His face Will you this moment His grace receive? Grace, grace, God's grace Grace that will and cleanse within grace, grace, God's grace, greater than, greater than all our sin. All right. Amen. You Thank you, Brother seated. Sean Hall. Thank you. All right. It's not, just watch where you're going. There we go. Step down. There we go. One more step. All right. Oh, it's not bad. <laughs> uh, this is Rhonda. Rhonda has come forward for for uh, <laughs> for scriptural baptism this morning, and uh, if you're happy for her, please say Amen this morning. Amen. amen. Praise the Lord. All right. Uh, by, by the way, baptism doesn't save you. This is a sign of obedience. You're just being obedient, showing the people in, in your community, in your church, that you have trusted Christ as your Savior. So, I'm just going to say this here, all right? Uh, Rhonda, let me ask you a question. Have you trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Are you trusting in Him and only Him to take you to heaven someday when you die? Amen. Well, upon your profession of faith, my sister, go ahead and put your hand up. Upon your profession of faith, my sister, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, buried in the likeness of His death, and raised in the likeness of His resurrection. Amen. Amen. All right. Praise Thank the Lord. You. Yes, ma'am. All right. Okay. Heather, come on up. Praise the Lord. Wednesday night, Heather was here in church, and she had some questions after the service, and we spoke. She got her assurance of salvation, and she's coming forward for baptism this morning. Dave. All 
All right. Amen. All right. Heather, question for you. Have you trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Oh, yeah. You're trusting in Him and only Him to take you to heaven someday when you die? Yes. All right. Upon your profession of faith, my sister, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, buried in the likeness of His death, and raised in the likeness of His resurrection. Amen. Amen. All right. Praise the Lord. All right, folks, you can stand at this time. We'll be dismissed. Brother Carey, if you'd please uh, dismiss our service here in a word of prayer.